Hello, this is Mr. White, and this is just a supplemental video on something that you should already be somewhat familiar with, uh, coming up with the transformed curves to make uh, Batman equations and such. Uh, the only slightly new thing is that we're going to involve some inverse trig curves, specifically inverse sine and inverse cosine this time. So again, this should largely be a review, but uh, again, it's probably a good point to, to do a video reminding you how to do these things. So here's our pattern for today. Um, we're going to do this... Um, this, this red curve and, the, and this blue curve, and come up with the equations for them. And the first thing that I've noticed students doing incorrectly is, is, is students tend to just leap right into trying to come up with an equation before giving adequate thought to what the basic curve looks like. In other words, in this case, uh, really thinking about what are the properties of inverse sine of x and, and inverse cosine of x before we've applied any transformations. So just as a, a really quick kind of review here, um, I'm going to throw this up on the screen, and it's something that should come pretty quickly to you. Let's think of what inverse sine is going to look like. More specifically, y equals inverse sine of x, or arc sine of x. Um, and again, I'm not going to go in detail as to how this came about, but we should be able to fairly quickly determine that inverse sine is the one that goes through the origin. and has a domain from negative 1 to 1, inclusive, and has a range. If you remember, inverse sine lands us angles in the fourth and first quadrant. So that means its range is negative pi over 2 up to pi over 2, inclusive. OK, so let's just leave that little picture there. And let's also do a quick little sketch of inverse cosine. And one of the first questions we really need to answer when we are coming up with equations for these Batman-type curves is which function am I going to use? Inverse sine, inverse cosine. And so again, you really want to have a clear sense of, um, of the properties of each one before you go diving into to one or the other. So inverse cosine, you should remember, lands us in the first or second quadrant. So um, that means that it goes from, the range goes from 0 to pi. And it also has a domain from negative 1 to 1 but looks more like this. Okay, so again, if you had any question on how these came about, then that's something to, to come to office hours for. But let's proceed to make a decision as to which uh, equation we're going to use for each of these curves. And the bottom line is, I'm going to say you can use either one, really. I can make either these red curves, and I can use either inverse sine or inverse cosine. Um, and same with the blue curve down here as well. I can really choose either one. So for the sake of this video, I'm just going to somewhat arbitrarily pick one and run with it. So let's start by using, uh, how about inverse cosine, and let's address the red curve up here. So let's just somewhat arbitrarily choose inverse cosine and set about uh, coming up with this curve. Okay, and, and again, another thing I see students doing is, is tending to jump right into the equation before really thinking carefully about what transformations we're dealing with. So I would strongly recommend just making a list of what transformations you see occurring here. Uh, I think one of the more obvious ones here is that we do have a, a vertical um, stretch. Now, um, let, me, let me also mention that let's focus on this half of the curve. And as far as how we're going to get this half over here, you may recall from previous discussions that an absolute value sign is going to help us get that. But we're really going to focus our energy at first on just this um, one on the right. Okay, so with that in mind, let's think. I, I just made the, uh, the claim that, in, that a vertical stretch is needed. So let's uh, write vertical stretch, and let's think of what the stretch factor needs to be. Um, notice that the, uh, the original height of inverse cosine, and I mean from bottom to top, the original height is pi units. It is pi units tall. And we should compare that to how tall I want it to be. How tall do I want this curve to be? Uh, well, that looks like I want it to be 1, 2, 3, 4, 5 units tall, right? So I've got a 5 and I've got a pi. And, and I, I, I don't blame the student if, if you're not sure. Does that mean we want um, a 5 over pi vertical stretch? Or does that mean we want a pi over 5 vertical stretch? It's a reasonable question to ask, but here's how we answer it. That word stretch, we, it used to be a little bit over three units tall. We now want it to be five units tall. That is definitely a stretch. 
And only one of those two numbers, those two factors, is going to give us a stretch. This factor right here, pi, or roughly 3-ish, over 5, is going to be a shrink, not a stretch. This, 5 over roughly 3.14, that's what gives us a stretch. So that's what we want. A vertical stretch by 5 over pi. Hope that made sense. As always, if it didn't, you know where to find me. Um, let's also do, uh, consider what happens horizontally. Um, and, and I do re generally recommend candling the stretches and shrinks first. I'm not going to elaborate in detail as to why I give that advice, but I generally find that avoids some confusions later on. So notice that that original width, it's really the same principle as what we did for vertical. That original width is two units wide, and how wide do I want it to be? Right there, I clearly want it to be one unit wide, right? So that again, that's gonna be a, that's gonna be a shrink. So horizontal shrink, I want it to go from two units to one unit wide. And if I stre said stretch earlier, I wasn't even necessarily listening to myself, but if I said stretch earlier, um, we've now determined clearly that going from two units to one unit is a, actually a shrink. So there are two of our transformations. And, and again, the horizontal and vertical stretches and shrinks are what I would definitely start with. And once you have done that, we then need to think about what other transformations there are. And this one I will concede is a little bit tricky, or can be a little bit tricky if you don't look at it the right way when you're dealing with inverse sine and inverse cosine, um, particularly inverse cosine. Uh, here, here's my general word of advice, is focus on where the origin is. Here's what I mean. Clearly, here's the origin in the original curve, but I would ask, where is that same corresponding point over here in the curve that I'm interested in? Well, notice that the origin is lined up with the bottom of this curve, right? So it's lined up with the bottom of this curve. So over here on, on the red curve, I'm looking at something that is lined up with the bottom of this red curve. Okay, so it's going to be somewhere along this line. And notice that the origin over here on the original uh, uh, inverse cosine is kind of midway between the left and right side of that curve. So it's, so it's right along a line that splits that inverse cosine right down the middle vertically. So notice that over here on our, on our graph here, a line that goes right down the middle, it's right there. So let's focus on that point right there. Um, I will acknowledge that this is a little bit different. We haven't quite had to look at things this way when we were doing the Batman curve earlier in the year, but this is how I suggest looking at it for inverse cosine and inverse sine. And when you look at it that way, we see that the origin has clearly moved 1.5 units to the right and then one unit up. So those are our uh, two more transformations. Let me just write it down here. This is getting a little messy, I know. But 1.5 right, one unit up. Now let's take a look and see if there's any other transformations. The only ones we haven't really considered are, are flips or reflections. And that's the orientation of this original curve is consistent with this orientation. They're both decreasing curves. There's really no need to flip it. So now that I have my list of transformations down here, it's time to actually come up with an equation. And let me clear up a little space on the uh, screen right here. All right, there we go. Let me uh, shrink this list down and put it up here in the corner. And let's go ahead and set about to, uh, to, to implement those, those transformations. Um, we'll start with our basic function, y equals inverse cosine of x. I'm going to leave myself some space here. And I'll go ahead and put the x right here. And let's do these, uh, these transformations one by one. Um, the vertical stretch by 5 over pi, that's a 5 over pi in front, right? The horizontal shrink by 1 half, we recall counterintuitively that that results on a 2 on the inside. And the uh, um, translation, 1.5 to the right, I'll go ahead and put counterintuitively minus 1.5. Uh, do you see what's missing here? need to recall that you need an extra set of parentheses with that one. And finally, one up. That means that we have a plus 
one at the end. I say finally, there is one last thing that, that I did say we need to, to get to. And that is the, uh, the fact that this equation as it stands right now should give us this curve. Uh, again, I'll leave it to you just for sake of time on, on this video. I'll leave it to you to, to affirm these on the calculator. But if we've done everything carefully, we should be in good shape. But what about this over here? Okay, without a whole lot of explanation, I hope this sounds familiar, but I'm going to make the claim that if you just put an absolute value bars in the right place in this equation, it should give you uh, both sides of that curve. And the right place is to replace any x you see with absolute value x. You don't want absolute value bars around the whole thing, you want it just around the x. And again, I'll leave it to you to confirm that that is what we wanted on your calculator. Okay, so let's call that one done. We've just done the red curve. Let's go ahead and move on to the blue curve. We're going to take a very similar approach with that one. Um, let me just go ahead and reduce some, some screen clutter here. Just for variety, again, I'll make the claim that we could use either inverse cosine or inverse sine. But since we just used inverse cosine on the last one, let's go ahead and use inverse sine for this curve. All right, and again, very similar approach. Let's start by listing our transformations. Uh, let's look at the original curve. The original curve, how many units tall is that? That is pi units tall. How tall do I want it to be? This blue curve, I want it to be two units tall, right? So that means we have, is that a stretch or a shrink? Well, it used to be roughly 3.14 units tall. Now it's two units tall. That is definitely a shrink. Let me write them up here this time. Vertical shrink. And again, let's, let's think about the fact that it's a shrink it means that we need two, the smaller number, over the bigger number, pi. That's what's going to give us a shrink. Okay, again, same thing horizontally. The original curve, how wide is it? Two units wide. How wide do I want it to be? And again, I'm doing the same thing as last time. I'm really focusing on the right-hand side. I'm kind of ignoring this part until the very end. So how wide do I want it to be? One, two, three, four, five, six units wide. So let's make that a width of six. Okay, um, so if it was two units wide, it, we want it to be six units wide, that means we need a horizontal stretch of three. All right, uh, again, same as last time. Let's, uh, let's think about where the origin is. And on this one, it's not as hard. It's a little harder with inverse cosine, but with inverse sine, since it's an odd function, the origin is right there in the middle of the curve. And we look at the, uh, our transformed curve, and this is the point that corresponds to the origin. And I clearly see that that is four units to the right, one unit down. So I'm going through this one a little bit more quickly. I hope you're getting the hang of it. That is our, those are our transformations. If we got that down, let's go ahead and write the equation. I'll clear some space on the screen here. All right, again, we said we're going to use inverse sine. So once again, y equals, let's leave ourselves some space, inverse sine of, um, let's put the x right there. And let's one by one go through our transformations. OK, again, vertical shrink, 2 over pi. That goes right here, 2 over pi on the outside, intuitive. Horizontal stretch of 3. That is counterintuitive, so that means we'll put a one-third in here. Four units to the right. So again, like last time, counterintuitive. That means a minus four, but we need to remember the extra set of parentheses. And finally, one unit down, intuitive on the outside, minus one. And our very last step, that, that will give us, if we've done everything correctly, and again, I'll leave it up to you to, to check it on the calculator, that will give us the right-hand side, the positive x values for this curve. And if we want to get both the positive and negative, one more time, we put absolute value bars just around the x and nothing else. And I'm going to claim that if you type that in your calculator, you should get this blue curve. No guess and check. Just a very methodical approach to coming up with this answer. Obviously, if any of this didn't make sense, come on by.